Okay. Um, well, thanks to, to Dan and, and to Nancy for uh, introductory remarks, which I think get to some of the, the really central issues here. Um, before I talk about a couple of the perhaps crunchier recommendations, the ones that have been more <laughs> controversial, I, I should say that um, when, when Paul Collier and I had the idea of setting up the uh, Fragility Commission, um, having found somewhat unexpectedly that David Cameron was available to chair it, um, uh, we very much motivated to, to produce a report free, which was genuinely independent. And I think there's an important message here for the Pearson Institute, that there's a real advantage uh, of, of crafting something like this in an academic institution, where you're really not part of the global policy process, but you can bring in people who are. Um, and, uh, and so what we tried to produce is something um, that could be really quite dispassionate in, in, in the approach it takes. Now, I think um, compared to the tone that, that, that uh, Nancy struck, I would, I would be a little more uh, pessimistic, I think, about where we are both conceptually and practically. I mean, the very, when we got together and we started to discuss the sort of substance of this report, what we were thinking is, well, the world cannot go on as it is. It may be true there's consensus, but that consensus, as you say, isn't, isn't delivering. And one needs to therefore begin to understand the reasons why the current approach is systematically failing in certain parts of the globe. So I'm going to sort of start from that slightly more pessimistic angle and, and try and suggest one or two things to begin with, and Adnan will amplify this, where we think the, the status quo is, is failing. Now, one of those which um, uh, got a certain amount of coverage when, when we reported was our view that the world wants to rush to running elections in fragile situations at far too early a stage of the process. Um, and this is deeply problematic in a divided society. In a divided society, elections often lead to greater polarization. And the risk with us coming out with that message was people say well, we were being anti-democratic in some fashion, which we're very, very much at pains to point out in a report. That's not what we're saying. What we were arguing is that you've got to have some notion of underlying power sharing consensus prior to an election. So, so is that still a problem? Well, look at what's just happened in Zimbabwe. Um, as soon as Mugabe goes, no attempt to build any form of consensus about what the policy platforms and priorities are. You rush straight to a div very divisive election. Um, thankfully, so far, the peace is, is holding in Zimbabwe. But I think it was a very typical example of the way state fragility has been approached. As soon as you've established some modicum of order, you run straight towards the election. And, and I think that's a, that's a problem. Now, that's partly driven, I think, by the agendas of the northern electorates who are influential in the way the policy engagement happens from the north. But I think it's also a kind of deep misunderstanding of um, the way that one of the deeper problems of, 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 um, of, of state fragility, which is the absence of legitimacy coming from uh, a polarized society very often with uh, the absence of any robust um, power sharing institutions at the center. So that's one thing we argue um, quite strongly. Something else we argue is um, that the policy priorities of the North can often get in the way of sensible strategies for dealing with fragility. So a very good example, we, we had um, many evidence sessions supporting our work. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was a very telling example when we engaged with a former minister in Tunisia um, uh, shortly uh, during the process of the Arab Spring. And um, uh, there was a question, what was the government going to do? And uh, the international aid community was coming up with their long lists of priorities, complete overload for the government. I mean, if they tried to do half the things that the international community wanted them to do, it was going to be literally impossible for them to deliver. Well, what did the Tunisian government decide to do? Their priority was to go out and clean the mosques. Absolutely nowhere on anybody's list of uh, policy priorities, most of the development community would thought this was an outrageous thing to be doing. But they understood that this was central to creating the kind of political environment and consensus that could allow them to move forward as a legitimate government um, in the eyes of their people. 
they eventually, in this instance, I think, did get support from the international community, but I think it's a good example, again, of how the priorities that come <laughs> externally often bump up against the things that make most sense. Um, so, so my final example, I'll, I'll kick over to Adnan, I'm sure he's got more to offer, um, was the state of play, which I think is improving among some of our major international organizations. The World Bank didn't really have, or still probably doesn't uh, properly have, a strategy for dealing in, in, in fragile states. The IMF was using the same template for Article 4 assessments. For those of you who don't know, Article 4 assessments are the standard of the way in which the IMF engages with any economy around the world. They were coming to uh, 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 dysfunctional states using the same template that they would use in France or Germany to do their economic assessment. Um, it's simply incapable of engaging in these kinds of difficult environments. So the IMF finally is beginning to raise its game, and we've been working with them um, quite a lot since our report came out. So I think there are examples, and you don't have to look very far for them, of de deep dysfunctionality in the way the international community is engaging with state fragility. And many of our recommendations came out of spotting those and trying to think of sensible ways forward. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Daniel. Uh, let me pick up from where uh, Nancy and Tim uh, from them. Uh, I think the first starting point is we have to start from an admission of failure, a sobering acknowledgement that what we have been doing is not working. And it's not working not because of money. Was it because of resources or money, Libya would be in a different place today. It's primarily not working because of our strategy. Because of our strategy is to disempower the very states that we are trying to support in the first place. You see all of the, the, the donor documents, the conferences, the talk is all about donorship, ownership, not donorship. The reality is very different. There is a huge gulf between the, the mantra of uh, ownership, not donorship, and the reality of intrusion on a day-to-day -day basis. The reality of, uh, of mandates, policy mandates in fragile states, which are set by donors. And donor-funded mandates don't work because they are not owned by the societies. The reality is no society has lifted itself out of fragility and poverty based on the visions of external actors. However benevolent those visions may be, they have done it themselves. Yes, based on support from outside, but themselves. And that's where the curse of Denmark hurts developing countries. That's what we mentioned in our report also. Having a vision of a very successful country that donors impose on, on, on fragile and poor countries to be copied idly in one leap. And now you know very well that uh, describing the characteristics of a currently successful state doesn't conjure them out of thin air. The central question in fragility, in fact, in development, is not about the end point. It's about charting a journey from here to there. And having a vision of a successful society doesn't necessarily help there, because it is often, this comparison is often used to draw a list of, a long list of things that are not there in the, in the fragile state, and that the country is supposed to, to achieve in, in a short leap. And the path from fragility to prosperity is not an event, not a leap. It's more of a process. It's more of a path. So our colleague on, uh, on, on the Fragility Commission uh, was a minister in Yemen in the, in the post-Arab Spring transitional government that uh, took over there, uh, I think, in 2012. So they were asked by the international community to deliver a civil service reform that was so ambitious that not even developed countries had done that within one year. They were asked to, to disband um, a major subsidy reform without any understanding of the consequences, because it was hugely politically costly, couldn't have been done at that time. And to top it all, they couldn't deliver for two years because they had the money but the international community didn't let them spend the money because they were coming up with a, with a law on public-private partnership and they were trying to perfect the law. 
for two years they came up they were coming up with the perfect law while the rebels were at the gate and they were uh, undermining the government this government is not delivering by the time they they passed the law they had the perfect law the rebels had taken over so overloaded mandates unachievable objectives unrealistic time frames all set by donors this is a recipe for disaster so our report talks about the fundamental thing that our report talks about is working with governments in fragile states and not around them empowering states empowering uh, fragile societies in charting their own path out of fragility and doing it in not in one leap but as a part of a process as a part of a gradual step by step approach where they chart their own path out of fragility let me stop here thank you so let me start the conversation these were some provocative thoughts which we love at the university of chicago the more provocative the better so we're going to have some vigorous debate on that so let me let me connect with one of the themes that um, that were brought up which i think is really a question about how do we think about the international community playing a positive role in this context i think anand slightly paraphrasing what you said that there is a no state that hasn't done this through its own processes and then there's a question mark to what extent the international community or the us policy community can play a positive role in encouraging this process and supporting that process nancy could you comment on that yes thank you and um, i i want to stick with a slightly more positive approach or view and say i do think there is consensus among people who really uh, come at this from more of the development lens that that's where over the last 15 years with big for the wonks among us the 2011 world development report also in 2011 at the development um, conference in busan was the landmark passage of something called the new deal for fragile states um, and this was signed up by many uh, of the international donors that was self-proclaimed fragile states. They, they owned the label and they came up with a platform of five peace building and state building goals. And if you look at the principles, there are a lot of the principles that have been further researched and elucidated so beautifully in the commission, uh, fragility commission. Um, and all of the donors, including the U.S., uh, signed up for this. And it had mutual accountabilities. Um, the problem is that it was a, an agreement ultimately between the development donor agencies and the, the, the planning departments of the fragile states. Who never participated in trying to put into action these principles local ownership, prioritization, you know, peace building and state building, flexibility over time, but with early wins. Who didn't sign up, either in the fragile states or in the, in the development partner states, were the diplomatic corps, were the security services. And so it stayed fragmented. There was never coherence. There was never true engagement with the ideas and with the principles. I don't think actually that there's disagreement among those who really have worked these issues that early elections just crystallizes fragmentation and opposition. But I know and there are people in this room who along with a number of us argued, let's not rush to elections in Mali. Let's not rush to elections in Central Africa Republic but you weren't able to move that agenda forward in the face of the diplomatic concern that if the coup were not quickly overturned by elections to legitimize the new government that we would that we would be in greater difficulty so so the the optimism that i bring is that i do think there is shared consensus and the reports like the fragility commission and, and you know the pathways to peace and the world bank reforms and even the imf very critical evaluation but it, it, it crystallized the issues 
It's there. It's now ready to be picked up and acted on. And so I really believe we're at a moment where we've got a lot of scholarship. We've got great evidence. We've got lots of research and agreement. We need to move it into action. And that's the moment that we, that we have right now. At a, at a more difficult time than ever, but I think the consensus is there to move us. So, so I see some nodding around the, the platform, which makes me a little nervous. So let me, let me, let me follow up with a question for, for Tim and Adnan. Um, one of the things that, uh, that you pointed, you started out with, with some of the more controversial recommendations, Nancy were talking about this as well, is this um, mistaken belief or desire to rush to multi-party or multi-candidate elections right away. And that um, it's much more important to make sure that there is there are checks and balances, that there's a kind of more inclusive political process, um, that um, if you will, the governance structures um, are set in place before we have an, an electoral process. You also mentioned that this has been, this had led to some criticism um, of these recommendations being undemocratic. And let me connect this a little bit to some of the things we've talked before. How do you deal with this tension? And, and specifically, if we believe that fragile states are in part characterized by a lack of legitimacy or breakdown of the social contract, which is another way people have talked about it, how do we manage the fact that you have, particularly after an autocratic regime, the desire for immediate elections? And then who comes in and says, wait a minute, we first have to put the checks and balances in place, and how do you handle this particular tension in a productive fashion? Yes. Uh, so we are not against elections per se. All we are saying that the rush to win or take all elections in the immediate aftermath of a, of a conflict doesn't necessarily help. In the absence of a, of a move towards creating common purpose institutions, in the absence of creating a common identity, because one of the features of, a, of a conflict societies and uh, fragile societies is there are oppositional identities. There are different armed groups that have red lines that don't want others to cross those red lines. And uh, in a political settlement, if the political settlement is immediately frozen and we have immediate elections afterwards, then the only basis, uh, perhaps the only basis of organizing people uh, around elections is, is their pre-existing identities. So whether they're tribal, ethnic, and others, without giving enough time for, um, for political parties uh, to, to reach out across the oppositional identities, to take efforts at mending those, those oppositional identities, that doesn't necessarily help. Uh, we had done evidence from, um, from the lady hired by the United Nations in writing constitutions around the world. And she basically said that her job was not really needed because, uh, because the constitution and the political settlements that are written and um, immediately after conflicts in many situations <coughs> Uh, basically freeze a political settlement at one point in time and don't allow that evolutionary process to take over. Um, you're absolutely right. Uh, all societies, including fra fragile settings, need legitimacy. And eventually, the, the path towards that legitimacy is to have elections. Uh, it's just a question of uh, called the building blocks or the requisites of those elections. Uh, look at the history of the uh, previous two decades. We had uh, elections in Afghanistan, and the first step that happened afterwards was the U.S. Secretary of State, John Kerry, flew over to tell the government not to, to count the votes, <coughs> because counting the votes would have led to perhaps another civil war. So eventually, they led to a power-sharing agreement. We had elections in, in Iraq, which were won by the Shias, but again, that didn't change the nature of the power. Uh, it changed who was in power um, from the Sunnis to the Shias, it didn't change the nature of the power. It didn't change the abuse of power. It didn't necessarily make the state more legitimate. So we are talking more about the building blocks of democracy. I don't know, Tim, if you want to add it. Okay, so let's open it up for some questions from the audience. And um, if you have a specific question for a member of the panel, please let us know. Um, or if you would like to have everybody um, answer, that would be great as well. And I'm gonna, uh, there's a question over there. I'll take that one. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Tariq Khosa from Pakistan with law enforcement background. Uh, let me say that what Tim and Adnan have identified is the strategy issue. It is very pertinent. A do donor-driven agenda doesn't work. It has to be driven from the national stakeholders. We have seen these conflicts in our part of the region. And uh, we firmly believe, I think, as practitioners also, that it is basically an understanding of the dynamics of a society and which revolve around justice, rule of law, or governance aspects. So elections is not only a name of a process, but it's an attitude or governance issues and rule of law concepts. So therefore, it is important that the international community has this sense of a shared responsibility. And from that point of view, the understanding the dynamics of a local society is impo important and crucial. These fragile states or frail states are basically because of the faltering policies of the state. So therefore, this lack of social contract between the citizens and the state is the driving force of what conflicts are basically getting uh, you know, aggravated. And what Nancy, I think, would support me in this is the USIP, USIP's efforts in the context of, of course, the international community uh, starts supporting kinetic measures, the military support, and that's important uh, to uh, combat terrorism. But in the context of co countering violent extremism and other aspects, governance, rule of law, building the capacity of the civilian institutions that deal like police services, the criminal justice system. That is where I think the focus need to shift and overall understanding of the conflict zones will arise if we really come to think of due processes, rule of law, and governance framework. Uh, USIP is involved in that context, and I'm sure Nancy would like to have a word of this, but Adnan, in the context of our region also, how would you say that are the elections making any difference, or is there a need for uh, more you know, governance and rule of law related uh, aspects that need to be given priority in these so-called frail states or fragile, and I think it's a faltering state which would be a correct nomenclature for Thank you. So perhaps Nancy and then Adnan and then Tim, if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, thank you for those comments. Um, I, if I could pull out a couple of, of threads, the first is the importance of, of having a security sector that is trusted by the citizens. And what we, you know, I would say that one of the greatest challenges that Tunisia faces, in addition to its economic woes, is that it still has a police force that is seen as a tool of a repressive regime. And so, you know, if you look at the, the international uh, set of tools and assistance, one of the biggest gaps is really effective ways to help police forces and uh, sectors to reform in countries. And I know that you're doing some excellent work and we're pleased to partner with the police in Lahore. Um, but that's, that's often uh, th the way in which people most directly experience their governments is how they interact with security sectors and how if they're not more responsive to people, people feel it as injustice and harbors these grievances. Um, on on um, the issue of local ownership, I, I just also, I mean, we've all mentioned that in one way or another, and this is probably the hardest nut to crack because it comes right up against, well, you've got to be accountable to your own Congress or Parliament for the funds that are expended, and corruption is often a hallmark of a lot of these very fragile environments. And so the question is, how do you craft some kind of mutual accountability compact such that the, 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 the partner countries, the donor countries, will respect local ownership and priorities as your report I identifies, but still has the accountability that the funds aren't going into someone's pockets. That's what some of these, you know, a variety of compact efforts have sought to craft, and we have never quite fully gotten there. Um, 
I think, uh, I think James, you were a part of the World Development Report of 2017, I, I believe, that looked at crafting better policy incentives for the elites uh, so that they would not undermine these kinds of agreements. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, you know, I think that's the, that's the piece of, of uh, additional work that we need to keep pushing on, is how to get these compacts right, how do we create the, both the, the, the accountability in both directions? Yeah, just one brief comment, actually, uh, following on from what Nancy said. We, 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 in, in one of our evidence sessions, we had some very interesting presentations on, by psychologists on police legitimacy, which is an area which has been studied at length. And one, one of the things that comes out of that, which I think is much, uh, a, a much broader lesson, is to think about legitimacy through process, not outcome. A lot of times, the literature that evaluates um, policy says, oh, the state delivered, it generated this outcome, as if that should, in the eyes of its citizens, enhance the legit legitimacy of the state. But actually, the evidence from the police legitimacy literature is it's not about outcomes. It's how you're treated in the process of interaction with the police. And in fact, people who are doing the most interesting work, training in the police force, understand that well. And, and you, know, you can generate a set of outcomes which could or not, could not be consistent with high levels of legitimacy. Okay. Thanks. I don't have much to add. Uh, all I would say is, uh, picking up from, uh, from Nancy, is uh, I agree with the comments. Uh, our report talks about empowering uh, fragile states themselves to come up with their own uh, policy priorities. But that doesn't mean that the international community doesn't have a role. The fundamental accountability that uh, states and governments and fragile states have is to their citizens, not to donors, but donors do have a role. So the way we come up with it, we resolve this tension is uh, we recommend that, we suggest that Fragile states to come up with their own policy priorities, but donors to hold them accountable for a minimum standard. And that minimum standard is, that includes there not to be mass looting or corruption, the government to be reasonably in inclusive, and the plan to be reasonably uh, realistic. Subject to this minimum standard, uh, we have a strong preference, uh, our recommendation is strongly for governments to come up with their own priorities because they, are, they should be held accountable by their own citizens for uh, the consequences of, uh, of their choices. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Right over there. The Honorable Ann Richards. Um, Buckle up, everybody. Okay, good. Yes. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> gentlemen, I uh, noticed that one of the members of your commission was Manoush Shafiq, who's a dynamic woman I met when she was uh, the permanent secretary of the Department for International Development in the UK, the UK's USAID. She then went on to have a very senior position at IMF. You've both criticized donors like DFID and the IMF. In your internal discussions, did she defend them? Did she agree with you? Has she, she converted to now that she's at LSE? <laughs> what, what, uh, uh, what, what, does, what did having someone with that kind of a background contribute to your discussions? Thank you. As advertised, go ahead, yes. <laughs> uh, I should say, uh, apart from being my boss, um, Manoush is a dear friend and um, uh, uh, let me, let, me, let me just tell you what the substance, I mean, uh, Nancy alluded to this, to the IMF report on the IMS failings in fragile states. A couple of things were kind of interesting and, and very basic. One was getting the best quality staff in the IMF to work in fragile states. You know, if you're sent as a freshly minted PhD student to go work for the IMF, you dream of life in Switzerland or I don't know where else. But actually getting people to go and work in the most difficult places have proven a huge challenge. So actually the, one of the major criticisms was also about just basic human resource management within the institution. Now was Manoush aware of that? You'd have to ask her at her time when she was at the, at the, at the IMF. Um, in terms of DFID's approach, of course in a, in a wider sense, DFID is indicted 
for having very much this donor-driven agenda and saying, you know, we're going to come up with our laundry list of all the things you should be doing, completely overloading the bureaucracies of many countries. And I, you know, as, far, as far as I can tell, uh, you know, that, that is now widely accepted even within DFID. These are learning institutions that all the time are, um, uh, are evolving their own strategies. And I think the, the messages uh, that we, we, we have for them have, have been well received. As has, for example, another message, and I'll just throw this out here maybe because it'll come up in discussion tomorrow, is much more focus on bringing the private sector in at the right stage of the process. And, there's a whole set of issues around how you engage with the private sector in the context of fragile states, which, which I haven't had time to get into. But again, that's an area where I think DFID and the World Bank could raise again. So I think everyone's learning. I mean, uh, th there are ways that institutions can improve. And I, and I think Manoush certainly was not in the, in the business of defending her, her past territory. Uh, and em embracing her new territory as director of LSE. So. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for participating for this lively, enlightening, and interesting uh, discussion. It ch challenged conventional wisdom and is on the, on the road to a new consensus, I think. Um, so uh, thank you for joining us to, uh, tonight, for sharing your insights, um, but most importantly for the work that you do every day. Please join me in showing our appreciation to a wonderful panel. <laughs>